Good evening. Uh, my name is Mohsen Milani, and I'm the executive director of the Center for Strategic and Diplomatic Studies in the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of South Florida. I welcome all of you to this third conversation with Dr. John Sennett, one of the most renowned experts on COVID and infectious diseases. Before I begin my conversation with our distinguished guests, uh, I'd like to make two points, a, a kind of house cleaning matters. Number one, I would like to make this conversation as interactive as possible. And therefore, as I am carrying on a conversation with our distinguished guests, if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, please use the right hand side of the tube of our, our YouTube channel in the chat section send the questions, and then uh, the gentleman who is running the show is going to send me the question, and then I will ask those questions from our guest. Number two, I would like to thank the support uh, I have received by, uh, uh, by the distinguished members of our Board of Advisors, that include the Honorable Judge Raymond Gross, Mr. Stephen Mitchell, Mr. Barry Alpert, Mr. Sam Bell, Dr. Karen Halbrook, Mr. Ted Wilhite, Mr. Charlie Stryker, and Mr. Gene Engel. Uh, it has been because of their guidance and support that I've been able to manage our Senate. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Don Melman, whose generous financial contribution made this specific conversation possible. Now let me say a few words about our guest, somebody that most of you know, and those of you who do not know must know more about him now. Dr. John Sennett is professor and has been chairman of uh, USF Internal Medicine for over a decade. He is a nationally and internationally renowned specialist on infectious diseases. He served as the Associate Dean of USF Medicine International. He is currently an infectious diseases specialist who cares for patients with life-threatening infections that are difficult to diagnose and treat. He was also instrumental in creating, along with USF College of Medicine and Tampa General Hospital, the Global Emerging Diseases Institute, which was the second, let me repeat this, which was the second COVID hospital in the nation and the first hospital with an intensive care. The Institute has 40% lower mortality rate and is in the top 20% for patient length of a stay. It is really a great pleasure Indeed, a great honor for me to have a conversation with Dr. John Sennett. Please join me to welcome our distinguished guest tonight. I have one brief correction. We're in the top one to two percent for length of stay. Uh, what did, did I yes. say? Twenty. I stand corrected. I. It's wrote here hours two percent of yes I, I I am sorry yes it's two percent thank you welcome to the program John it's my honor to be here uh, we face such a grievous pandemic it's hard to even know where to begin um, I think Victor Hugo said it best that the other end of the telescope is the microscope. Uh, I think you should ask some questions from the telescopic viewpoint, like what do you see? And then I can take it from the microscopic viewpoint. It would be great. Very good. Uh, let me start with my first general question. You and I had a conversation about a year ago, and much has changed. Uh, what is your professional assessment? of how we have dealt with uh, the COVID uh, problem in this country during the past 
year or so? Um, I feel that if we look at the numbers, two days ago, uh, 3.5 million people died in the world of COVID, okay? One million of those were in the United States. Um, it's just, no, they didn't die, but new cases. I think that when we try to answer that question, we have two different answers. Scientifically, we're doing unbelievably well. For instance, we have identified the virus, we've developed exquisite tests for the virus, we've developed a vaccine, uh, several vaccines, all of which are very effective. Finally, we've even developed several treatments. So scientifically, things are great. Sociologically, things are a catastrophe. Uh, the dichotomy in our society is extremely disruptive to public health. Uh, people listen to politicians or the internet when really science speaks pretty clearly to the issues. Dr. Dr. Senate, if you do not mind, I'd like to interrupt you because I have a couple of specific questions about the social aspect of it. Let me first cover the medical aspect. And if you do not mind, we'll get back to this later on, which takes me to my second question. Uh, many people are confused about these variants of COVID. Uh, using a layman language, please tell us what is it that we need to know about these, uh, about the mutation of these uh, vir uh, of this virus, and why do they mutate so quickly and so frequently? Uh, viruses are a form of what we call acellular life. They're alive, but they're not in cells. The primary genetic material is DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. Okay, but these viruses, which is very stable, these other viruses have RNA, ribonucleic acid, and they're not stable. The very nature of this organism is to mutate. And it mutates at very frequently, even within the same person. So, the risk is that if it continues to, to grow unchecked, we're going to have more variants. The variants refer not just to the clinical manifestation of disease, but also to the biochemical makeup of the virus. So there are three levels. There's variants of interest. In other words, we're looking and just yesterday, the new Omicron BA2 came out. It was very hard to recognize. It's so subtle, but it's different. And in the short time period, you know, looking back, less than a month, 45% of the infections in parts of Europe are due to this virus, which means it's more contagious than Omicron, which I think might be one of the most contagious viruses in the world. Um, the mutation of the RNA viruses is unpredictable. If the virus killed you right away, it would not be able to mutate. But the fact that we have individuals infected that are sick for weeks, okay? During that time, they're going to make viruses that are not identical to what they should be. And unfortunately, those mutations occur at the tail end, which codes for the spike protein, which guides how it attaches to a human being. So we might as well get used to the variants. We're going to keep seeing variants until everyone in the world is vaccinated. 
which is going to be quite a while. Well, you brought up the issue of vaccination. My third question is about uh, those who are cynical or what I call doubters about the use of vaccine. They argue, and you've probably heard this in, uh, on television and radio and, and in social media, they essentially argue that because people who have been fully vaccinated and even boosted, they still got uh, COVID infection. And they conclude that the human immunity system is stronger than vaccines, and therefore they refuse to get vaccinated. I know you disagree with this, but again, tell us why it is so important to get vaccinated, even if, even if you eventually uh, get exposed to the virus. Well, everyone will eventually get exposed. You have my guarantee. Everyone. Everyone. And the idea that natural immunity is as good as vaccine immunity is wrong. Natural immunity consists of you getting the virus and the first antibody that works, the first, not the best, proliferates and that kills the virus, okay? But when you get a vaccine, you get, you may produce the most active antibodies. It's far more protective to be vaccinated than to be naturally infected. Now, why people feel they're qualified even to make these decisions about an area of immunology and immune response that I don't understand after 39 years of doing this, but yet they seem to be able to go on YouTube or the new TV and understand this. Um, very clearly, it is a social obligation to be infected. In Tampa right now, 6% of the population roughly is immunosuppressed. If they get the virus, they're going to be horribly sick. And how sick is it? If, if they're not vaccinated. If they're not vaccinated. Well, the vaccine does not work that well in the immunosuppressed population. The purpose of the vaccine is to keep well people out of the hospital. It's not to prevent them from getting sick. That is a gross mistake. The purpose of the vaccine is you may get sick, but you won't go into the hospital or the ICU and you won't die. That's a, but as far as contracting the illness, it reduces it, but that's not the purpose, okay? It's about 80% effective at reducing your chance of getting it, but it's 98% effective at keeping you out of the ICU. Now, what does that mean? If you end up on a breathing machine, depending on which study you look at, your age, your weight, etc., if you had a perfectly well specimen, with no chronic diseases, in great health, they would have about a 50% chance of living from the ventilator. If you get an obese person, cigarette smoker, hypertensive, diabetic, they have about a 7% chance of coming off a ventilator a lot. That's so incredible. to subject people at risk to this is morally wrong. I know I travel a lot in Asia, and were I to get on a plane or a bus or train without a mask, people would say things to me. And that's the culture protecting itself. What happened to caring about your neighbor? 
what happened to caring about your family? The way the virus works is so intrinsic is it first spreads within the family. Then from inside the family, it goes out to the community. Why would you put your child at risk? Your husband, your wife. You know, you may come home and feel sick for weak and perfect health, but Uncle Ed with diabetes is going to die. And Aunt Emma with COPD is going to die or they're going to suffer horribly. My next question is um, regarding people who have been exposed. If I'm not mistaken, I have read in newspapers that a recent research has shown that COVID is, the virus is able to infect neurons in our brain. Uh, my question is, what kind of cognitive symptoms have people with COVID been exhibiting? And how does infection actually impact our brain? I think you've asked a million dollar question. About five to eight percent of COVID patients don't get better. Many of them have a chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia syndrome, where they have slowed cognition, increased sensitivity to pain, and lack of energy. And these people, many are disabled. Um, the long-term effects, neurologic, are unknown. I would draw a correlation to the great influenza of 1918. Or it wasn't until 10 years later that they developed von Economos encephalitis and Parkinson's. 10 years. So somebody could get COVID now. We don't know. In 10 years, they could have Parkinson's. There's no knowledge. Okay. Now, there's not a lot of follow-up because most of those people have died. But the long-term effects of this infection are unknown. They worry me greatly. Part of the story comes from direct experience in China with SARS-1. In 2003, I traveled to Beijing and the Infectious Disease Institute in Tianjin. And uh, I'll never forget a pathologist I met who cared for. He did well. He went home. I returned in three years, and he's in a wheelchair. Totally unpredictable. These are new viruses. No one knows what they're capable of. And, and my next question is sort of a follow-up uh, to... Uh the impact of uh, COVID on our brain. You were talking about, uh, as you know, there, there is such a thing as long haulers. Uh, these are people whose symptoms of uh, the infection persist for months following uh, the diagnosis. What are the ramifications? What are the problems these long haulers face? And is there anything they can do to address it? And is there anything people who have been infected with virus can do to prevent having the symptoms or having the problems of long haulers? Um, you can prevent much of long haulers by getting vaccinated. That takes it out of the question. Long haulers is a tragic disease at the Global Emerging Disease Institute we are literally building half of a floor, about 30,000 square feet, 
to take care of these patients. And they run the gamut of patients that are too weak to get out of bed, or people too tired mm. to work, or people that have trouble making decisions. It is a whole array of diseases that we have to learn about. So we'll be conducting a great deal of research there. We're bringing researchers to look at it. No one knows what to do about it. Everyone knows it's a problem. But nobody can do anything about it. There is no, and it, it can come on even months after you've had COVID. So you can feel you're recovered, but then <coughs> 60 days later, you start feeling weak or short of breath. And that becomes progressive. Um, the, the frightening aspect is, I think to me, is that the community doesn't recognize that this is a new germ. We don't know what it can do. We don't. We know that what we can see so far is terrible. What we're going to see in the future, I'm pretty grim. So is that safe for me to say this is an invisible and largely unknown enemy we are going to be facing for years to come? Absolutely. You are totally now, Dr. Right. Senna, based on your experience at Tampa General Hospital and your practice in Tampa Bay Area, would it be possible for you to provide us with a profile of people who come to the hospital for COVID care? Would it be possible to generalize based on your experience? I can, I can generalize. I can actually give you statistics out of every you probably have between 180 and 200 patients in the hospital right now of those 10 will have been vaccinated the rest have not been vaccinated so that group is putting nurses at risk physicians at risk radiology technicians and their families at risk um, the few that do have vaccines, either A, might have had an immune defect, B, didn't time the vaccine appropriately, or C, their immune system just didn't react properly. But overall, for most people, it is, it will keep you out of the hospital. So 10 you said are unvaccinated of 200. Uh, Yes. That is about 5%. And do we know why uh, that 5% is in the hospital, even if were they both uh, fully vaccinated and boosted or only vaccinated or half vaccinated? I don't have the breakdown on that. But for example, uh, one patient has HIV. Their immune system is a mess. Another patient has chronic lymphocytic These leukemia. are the people who are unvaccinated. No, these are vaccinated, vaccinated. people. But they don't mount the right response. Okay? Although, occasionally, normal people, well vaccinated, can have catastrophic outcomes. That's how unpredictable it is. Dr. Sarad, you started by talking about the social ramifications of this disease. As you know, we have some folks who are suing uh, their, their local governments or uh, educational board of, of their local community for mask mandate. Almost two years has passed since the start of this pandemic. Uh, what are the latest guidelines from CDC about wearing masks? And what is your own personal and professional uh, judgment about the importance of wearing uh, a mask? Um, 
the CDC guidelines are going to change almost weekly. And the reason for that is the virus is changing, number one. Uh, number two, we're going to understand better how the virus works. In other words, this new strain, Omicron, is able to get through some masks. When a person wears a mask, the idea behind the mask is 25% to protect you, but 75% to protect other people. So when you wear a mask, you're protecting people around you. Uh, wearing a mask to me should be mandated. People should wear masks. I don't like my life being threatened by people that don't like to have a piece of paper over their face. I spend 12 hours a day with something like that on my face. It's not that uncomfortable. And I certainly know what the alternative is. And if you look at the 3 million people that live in Asia, they certainly know the value of masks. Um, before I go to my last questions, I just uh, saw a question from somebody both of us know, former president of our university, Ms. Betty Haster. Uh, and her question is, how do we vaccinate for variants we haven't even seen yet? That is a great question. It is. Um, we're not at the stage where we're able to do that yet, but we will be, okay? Uh, it takes very complex theoretical mathematical models to predict the next strain, okay? And every time we try to do it, we come away with mud on our face because you're trying to predict what a living object is going to do, which you can't. It's the definition almost of pure randomness. What we need is a vaccine that is probably directed against some core proteins mm -hmm. that will protect against all coronaviruses and not just the next strain. But for the moment, we have to be content with going strain by strain. Uh, I have another question. Uh, are there factors that make someone more likely to be a long hauler? We believe there are. In looking at genome studies, very large, you know, whole genome studies, there seem to be some genes associated with patients that don't recover. Now, how those genes work, we don't know yet. And recall that all genetic activity is filtered through the microbiome, the covering of bacteria that lines our bodies, covers our skin. So we're ways off from figuring that out. We do know that there seems to be a death gene in some people that stops interferon from being produced. So you can't fight the virus off, okay? We know that the interferon is very important for you to look at the death statistics, men die at a rate four times the rate of women because women who have to bear children have to protect that embryo. So they are flat geared for viral protection much better than men are. Um, so there's an interplay of genes. There's some aspect of the microbiome that we don't understand, uh, and the multitude of risk factors, obesity, hypertension, uh, all contribute to mortality. 
Let me ask one other question from the audience, and then I'll go back to the questions I wanted to ask you. Uh, this one is about, uh, uh, he says, uh, the gentleman says that I have heard of many COVID patients reporting brain fog month after infection. What is brain fog? What are the signs of brain fog? I alluded to that a little earlier. Patients with brain fog have trouble with what I what people would call executive function of the brain. So you're in the grocery store and you can't decide whether to get this type of peaches or that type of peaches. And you'll agonize for moments because you can't decide. Or you have to decide um, what is the best route to drive, say, to get to a different city. They have a great deal of trouble conceptualizing. You know, you have a mental picture in your mind. If I go east on I-4, I'm going to end up in Lakeland. They will have trouble figuring out things like east and west. These can be significant defects. They often, with this fog, get simple numbers mixed up. So you will give them a phone number to remember, and they'll get one number out of order. We measure this with the Montreal Test of Cognitive Ability, and it's markedly abnormal in these patients. And these are very tragic patients. Some of them are 18 and 19 years old. And we don't know what the natural course of this is. To me, I think it's a variant of chronic fatigue syndrome and just John Sennett's opinion. And I don't think they're going to get better for years. But again, no one knows. Before I go to the questions from the audience, uh, something related to what you were talking about. How important is it for people to take these uh, rapid tests at home? When should they take it? And how accurate are they? Um, they're getting better every day. Uh, if a rapid test is positive, it's positive. There are no false positives, okay? That's the FDA law. Now, there can be false negatives, okay, where you're infected, but it doesn't show up. You don't swab the nose right, okay? You don't follow the directions on the kit, or the kit sat on the dashboard of your car for three days before you used it. So a negative result, we don't know what to make of. When someone has the symptoms of COVID, headache, muscle aches, fever, cough, but a negative rapid test, I uh, offer them a choice. You can come and get a complicated deep nasal swab, okay? Or you can use a simple rapid test. My advice is often use the rapid test the next morning. Don't brush your teeth, okay? Don't eat anything. Just as soon as you wake up, do the test then. Because by the end of the day, the virus is diluted, exposed to spices, cigarette smoke, who knows what. So the very first thing in the morning, you're going to have a better chance of being positive. Secondly, People do, do not look at these test strips closely enough. And I have to draw a comparison with um, one of my female doctors who said, if it were a pregnancy test, they'd have the magnifying glass out. Whereas if it's a COVID test, there's no line, you're okay. So I do use a magnifying glass. People who work with me will tell you that. And I examine them very closely. And even a trace line is positive. Uh, let me ask you one final question myself. 
uh, you and I again, I recall vividly, talked about the origins of this uh, virus about a year or two years ago when we started our conversation series. And I ask you at that time, what are the chances that this virus was actually manufactured in a lab or built in a lab or made in a lab and then got out of the lab either by uh, accident or by somebody's decision? Based, everything, based on everything you have read uh, during the past year or so, what do you think we stand today? Can we say that can we essentially eliminate the possibility of foul play or uh, the jury? Is I would foul play. I would absolutely guarantee no one would try to make a biologic weapon without a treatment. That's <laughs> doesn't. It's, it doesn't make any sense at all. I used to strongly feel that this went from animals, bats, through an intermediate animal to man. Then, after a lot of reading, I found out that if a person were infected with two coronaviruses at the same time, you ended up with a third virus different than the first two. I actually think that is the most likely scenario, but that's not published about much. Now, could it have broken out of a lab? It would have to have been a mistake, okay? It would not be on purpose unless there's some psychotic foul play involved, but it wouldn't be a government initiative of let's see what happens when we do this. Um, the uh, things that make, make us suspicious about, they use mice with what are called humanized immune systems, okay? In other words, these mice are grown, but they have human lymphocytes and human tissue in them. Okay, so it is possible that in the lab somebody decided to put this in a humanized mouse, see what happens. Wow, and then somehow the mouse sneezes on another worker. Surely a, an adventitious event. Um, I now, I used to discard that totally. Now I think there's a, about a 10% chance. Uh, most virologists still feel that this went from animals to man. Now an interesting turnabout is Omicron, which I have spent a lot of time studying. In my mind, I absolutely believe that Delta infected animals, mutated in animals to Omicron, and then ping pong back to man. Because there's no way in humans you're going to end up with 31 mutations. Our lifespan is too long. This has got to be an animal with a lifespan of a year, a mouse, a rat, something like that. One of the problems of uh, reading questions from your cell phone is that sometimes you uh, uh, mix up the names. And uh, I made a mistake, uh, and I said that uh, uh, Betty Castor asked the questions about uh, vaccine that we haven't seen. Uh, her actual question is, what is the vaccine policy for employees of Tampa General Hospital? Another good question. Oh, yeah. The policy is that we encourage everyone to get vaccinated. It's uh, whatever the federal law is, we follow the federal law. Now, 
it's confusing a little bit because about 30% of people that have nothing to do with patients at all. You know, they're bookkeepers, uh, computer scientists, things like that. So uh, we're attempting to get everyone vaccinated through a social spirit, through the idea of protecting each other, and we're doing very well. I might add also that JEDI is staffed by people that want to be there. We don't force anyone to go into that unit that is not protected and doesn't want to go. And I think it makes me very proud of the medical and nursing profession to think of all the people that volunteer to work there. Dr. Senat, can you or anyone in an administrative position at Tampa General Hospital or any hospital in the state of Florida, can they specifically ask an employee, a doctor or a nurse, that are you vaccinated or not? And show me the proof. Or is that based on uh, good faith? State law prohibits that. There's conflict between state and federal law. Um, right now, I really don't see the need for it. We have good records. And secondly, in medicine, between medical personnel, not between people outside the profession, but inside, okay, you know very well who's vaccinated or who's reluctant. Um, and they're often subject to great peer pressure about that. Uh, Dr. Senna, do we know nationwide what percentage of doctors and nurses have been infected with this virus? I, I don't know that anyone knows that number. Uh, the number, the statistic I like is that we don't even know how many doctors there are in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> That's not encouraging. <laughs> the, um, and Florida has never been good with numbers. I would tell you that in general, 99% of physicians are vaccinated. And at least 75 to 85% of nurses. Um, a gentleman, uh... Mr. Solomon, Raymond Solomon, is asking what supplements can people take to boost the immune system? I think I know the answer, Dr. Sennett, because you told me that the last time we had a conversation, but go ahead. I love um, an overlooked article in the British Medical Journal showed that by taking vitamin D, you can reduce upper respiratory infections. And interestingly enough, in Florida, of all places, with all the sun, because everyone uses sunblock and covers up, we have low vitamin D levels. But in the Carolinas, everybody's normal. So I encourage people to take, if they don't have kidney stones, they should take vitamin D. How much? 5,000 units a day. How much? 5,000 units a day. 5,000 a day. Or 4,000. Four or 5,000. I have another question from... M More than that. Okay. From Iman. He says, do you think we are getting close to the point of herd immunity? Hasn't most of the population either been vaccinated or infected at this point? Um, I'm... There, it's important to state that there is debate within the scientific community about herd immunity. It doesn't bubble to the surface much. It's an, an intricate discussion. But if you were to look, there's no herd immunity to tuberculosis. There's no herd immunity to group A strep. There's no herd immunity to urinary tract infections. So herd immunity 
can exist with some viruses, some bacteria, but certainly not all. So we don't really know if herd immunity can exist for this virus. But it would be great if it did, but it's an unproven concept. As a matter of fact, Great Britain, one of the most vaccinated countries in the world, is having perhaps the worst outbreak as we speak. Uh, another question is, uh, are uh, long haulers able to pass the virus to others? No. The, um, an excellent question. Uh, once a person develops symptoms, sore throat, headache, cough, fever, scientifically, they're contagious for eight days. That's it. Now, what we do is because of vagaries and onset rules, was it 2 a.m. or 10? Uh, is your immune system perfect? How old are you? So we usually use an arbitrary amount of 10 days, okay? But patients that have gotten monoclonal antibodies, uh, patients that have received Paxlovid, are really not contagious after five days. If they have any real therapeutic, and it's probably shorter than that. It, we have not had time to study it. There is another question, and I'm really interested to know, but but that's a tough question to ask, but I'm going to anyhow. Could you ask Dr. Senate how he evaluates the Russian Smutnik or Chinese Sinopharm vaccines? Well, I have personally talked to my colleagues in Russia and in China. Uh, they receive boosters just as we do. Their vaccines are much simpler, okay? They're not made of RNA. Instead, they're made more like tetanus vaccine. They're given a protein and your body reacts to it. Um, it's, uh, these are not as good, not as all-encompassingly protective as an mRNA vaccine but they are about 75% effective. And the physicians, both in China and Russia, take the vaccines enthusiastically, and they will often take multiple doses. Uh, as I said, the last time we were together, uh, you and I had to discuss the title of this conversation. And the title I had, you vetoed it, and you came up with a very attractive topic, predicting the unpredictable. So here is how I want to put you in the spot. Let's say a year from now, you and I are going to have our fourth conversation about COVID. What do you think you're going to say a year from now? And how long do you think we have to deal with this despicable virus? Um, no one likes to ask me questions like that because I never have an answer they want to hear. The virus is going to be with us forever. It's a fact of life. Okay? Forever. Forever. It's going to keep mutating. Okay, because of the makeup of the virus, where you carry the virus before you feel sick, it's still going to spread. I worry long term about the impact on global security, about the impact on national economies. I worry about the impact on education where people are not able to go to school 
I worry about the impact on children that get infected with the virus. We have no idea what it does to children. And the fact that parents would send their kids and let them get exposed, this isn't a chicken pox party. This is Russian roulette. Um, I think that it will be a sad, tragic discussion of missed opportunities and what could have been done better. Recall that we're focused on Tampa, Florida, and peripherally, I guess, in New York and California. But we have no idea what's happening in the continent of Africa. We have no idea what's happening in India. In, in China, we know that they're determined to eradicate the virus from their country. But the news is not going to be good for the rest of the world. And the impact of world trade, you know, what, what happens when you can't just get on a plane and go visit Argentina, or that you can't recruit students from Portugal. And I think there's ramifications to this that are very much in your wheelhouse, very global, and much more due to the impact of the virus on society than the impact of the virus on people. Dr. Zenit, would you recommend, if, if I ask you that I'm planning to have an international trip, say to any European country or to Latin America or to Asia, as my doctor, would you recommend that I do? Or if I come to you and say I'm planning to have a cruise, would you uh, uh, recommend uh, cruises at this time? I would definitely not recommend a cruise. Um, I believe that cruises are on their way to getting shut down again. Um, cruise boats recirculate air way too much because they don't want salt air inside the cabins because of corrosion issues, among other things. Um, we all have to make a decision based on individual risk. So what is the risk? Well, obviously, if you have leukemia and you told me you wanted to go to New York, I would tell me tell you you're crazy and don't do it. Okay? On the other hand, a healthy 18-year-old, vaccinated and wearing a mask, who wants to go to California, sure, I think they'll do fine. But as we age, we get risk factors. Um, and the older people are, not that you're old, but I am, um, we have to be, you're going to have to develop a system that you triage how much is it worth to do something. Am I willing to risk my life doing this? Well, uh... I promise Dr. Sennett, who has a very busy schedule, that we're going to finish this in 50 minutes. And uh, therefore, we have come to the end of this truly educational and informative uh, uh, conversation with Dr. John Sennett. Uh, John, thank you so very much for this opportunity, for edu educating us and making us think hard about the kinds of problem we will be facing. Thank you so much. And before I say good night to all of you, please, in case you want to be in our waiting list, in our mailing list, please just send your uh, email address to uh, uh, to the chat uh, section, and we will include you in our uh, 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 mailing list. With this, thank you all. Have a wonderful evening, and please. Stay safe. And if you're not vaccinated, please get vaccinated. God bless all of you. Thank you so much.